All right, folks, I'm Rich Folley. This is PBS Book View Now. Welcome to day three of the Miami Book Fair 2016. It's Sunday. It's another beautiful day here, which is just wonderful. No rain, all sun, and more sunshine on our couch today. That was my, my quick jump. Uh, I'm sitting right now with Lee Bardugo, who's the author of the we're second the book. Sunshine. Let's I always thought that. <laughs> yep, we're going to yeah. make that leap. I think that will turn out to be true, though. We're <laughs> sitting with Lee Bardugo, who's the author of the second book in your... Uh, your uh, Six of Crows series, Crooked Kingdom, mm -hmm. Red Pages, awesome. Yeah. And with Alexander Bracken, Alexandra Bracken, who's the author of Passenger, which is the first in your series, but we were just talking about the fact that your next Wayfair comes out in January, so you're switching gears soon to the second book in the series. Yeah, book two. Yeah, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks. You know, as I was thinking about pairing you and thinking about all the combinations and elements that we could talk about today, one of the things that I love, yours is a time travel book that goes through all sorts of different uh, eras of Europe primarily, and your books are really driven by this vision of, this European vision that you have, whether it's, it's Russia or Amsterdam. I mean, Ketterdam, which is the, the main city in your books, really is a, a amalgamation of different cities. But I wanted to talk first of all about that sort of idea of foreign travel in European cities and how it is that they came into these novels for you both. And we'll start with you, Lee. Oh, I was like, I don't want to know. Um, well, we could jump, we could go anywhere you want. I was want. like, there. Um, look, for me, you know, when I wrote my first trilogy, the, the prospect of being able to travel to research was not in the cards. I was dead broke and had to work and that was not going to happen. And in fact, I didn't get to visit Amsterdam or the Netherlands until um, after Six of Crows was written. But there's a lot of other influences in there, like Venice, like Vegas, like old New York. And I think for me, a lot of the work really, and research happens through books. And it, it kind of makes sense because that's the way I traveled as a child and before I ever had the money to actually go out there and see things myself. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, how about you, Alexandra? Yeah, so originally Passenger was just gonna be set in New York in 1776, and then I decided I really wanted to challenge myself and make it inclusive and try to hit all the continents. Fortunately, there was no reason why they had to go to Antarctica, so that didn't work <laughs> out. Yes. But I tried to really diversify the different locations that they were going to, and in some cases I'd been to the locations. Like I uh, studied abroad in London for a while, so I could felt like I could write comfortably about that, been to Paris, but then like Angkor Thom, I like had never been to, so I would rely on YouTube tourist videos as they walk through the different locations and try to figure out the layout that way. Yeah. Just kind of like did not realize when I first started writing Passenger, I would be relying on tourist videos to give me a sense of a place's layout. Like the but internet has been a huge boon to those of <laughs> us on deadline because even when I was working on Wonder Woman, all of a sudden I was writing in a real world, yeah. which I had never done before. And I was like, I don't, what does this even look like? So I would get on Google Maps yeah. and I would follow a road for miles and then like look up, look around. <laughs> I got, got actual car sick, car sickness because <laughs> I kept oh, no. yeah. I it, think, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's so true when you use, when you're trying to write about a place you've never been, you have to rely on first person accounts. So I would go kind of back in time sort of in the era, era I was trying to write and find like a journal of someone who visited and get a sense that way, sort of weed through their biases, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just like plain research, but also like a little bit of imagination, I think is necessary. Yeah, but I think for a lot of people who read your books, they're doing what you said, they're traveling for the first time in some cases to some of these far flung places and oftentimes imagined and added elements to them and they're sort of creatively uh, you know, perked up a little bit, but I think that they feel definitely that they're not at home. And I think that's one of the cool things about both of your books is that there's a, a sense of adventure and, and something very different from the world that they know. When you talk to your readers, how much is that a part of it, that sort of sense of going to another world and just leaving the one that they're in and sort of visiting someplace else? I think it's a pretty powerful thing, especially yeah. in fantasy and science fiction. I think that feeling of, like, even if you're in your own world, there's this feeling of this other world that's operating at the same time. And I think it gives this extra layer to your life. And I, I always say that, that fantasy fans are the people who always, you know, they never stop thinking that the door is going to lead to Narnia yeah. or that the call box is bigger <laughs> on the inside so or that true. they're yeah. going to get the letter from Hogwarts. Like, that, we, that never leaves us. And I would be so sorry if it did. Like, I think that, that that makes life much more exciting and interesting. And I think also it can be a great comfort 
to leave a place that might be m much more dire and frightening on the outside mm -hmm. than your own world, but that sort of gives voice to all the things you feel are dire on the inside, but that other people are kind of being like, it's fine, it's fine, everything is fine. And yeah. you're like, it's not fine. And you read a book where everything is not fine. Um, but it's happening in a sort of safe space. And I yeah. think that can be really powerful for kids. Yeah. Well, and I think our readers, I mean, I feel lucky that my readers tend to run from middle grade to adults, and mm -hmm. I feel like that's the same for you too. But in the instance of the readers who are in middle school and in high school, I think they feel very stationary in their lives and they yes. have a set routine. And so I do think it's important for them to read books that there are journeys they can go on, like an imaginative journey yes. if they, until they were able to yes. actually travel and they have that independence. Yeah. And I personally, growing up, I loved journey stories, which is, I think, why I'm inclined to write them now. I just think it's fun. When I, I was leave. a kid, I, we, I switched schools, and that was when I was 12. My mom remarried, moved to a new neighborhood, mm -hmm. switched schools. It, it really was like landing on an alien planet. <laughs> and I walked into the library at my new school. It's a little library, and there was this table set out by some glorious unnamed librarian, thank you librarian, thank that you, librarian. said, explore new worlds. And I was like, <laughs> I will. And that's how I got into science fiction and fantasy. There and I go. needed it, you know. But it's not, and it's not just like traveling to other places too, it's different voices. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, Lee, you write in six points of view in yes. your book. How and did you're you do that? Going between <laughs> all these different people. So within the same book, you're seeing the perspective of a lot of different human beings with a lot of different backgrounds and yes. a lot of different lives. And to me, that's one of the things that I feel like the world needs more of, right? I mean, to sort yeah. of transport yourself into someone else's brain for a little bit and to understand sort of what drives them and motivates them outside of your own head. And that you sort of do that without thinking as you're reading your books, but you are putting yourself in someone else's life six yeah. different times in your yeah. books in particular. I mean, I, I think that's actually really important for Alex's book too, because of what Nicholas deals with over these different yeah. time periods. And even the way he relates to modernity is very different um, because of who he is and his background. Um, Thanks, friend. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean, look, I think we live in a time where empathy has become increasingly important. Yeah. And you know, there's all kinds of studies that show that reading builds empathy. And I think the idea of not only being able to live your life but to explore somebody else's life and see an other and have it and, and identify completely with it, be in their head, be in their shoes, experiencing things, I, I think is incredibly important. And I also think like, you know, fantasy and an adventure and romance and danger don't belong to one kind of person. Yeah, that's true. We should tell, explain to people who might not know your books. I mean, there's... Yeah. You know, uh, Alex, your book's Etta and Nicholas. There's mm -hmm. these time-traveling people that come together <laughs> from, from different times and travel through time to get this device. They need this astrolabe, which is a really cool thing. And yeah. they're moving through different eras. And that whole notion of time travel obviously drives this book, and it gives you a lot of freedom to play in a lot of different eras, too. But think, t talk to me a little bit, and as you're explaining this book to some of the folks, about that relationship that not only crosses sort of different types of people, but different times, too. Yeah, so I went to school at the College of William & Mary, which is, if you've never been to Colonial Williamsburg, it's set up to make you feel like you've step traveled back in time, and the reenactors don't break character until they're down the street in Wawa <laughs> buying a sandwich for lunch. Um, <laughs> Which but, is weird. Yeah, which is Did always like, work? no, I never, oh. yeah. No, that was Alexandria, all, so I know that whole world. Yeah. That, yeah. In Williamsburg, I never could be a reenactor because they all were like history master students, like wow. PhDs, like very smart people who were very invested in it. But I wanted to capture that feeling of being a fish out of water and having your modern sensibilities juxtaposed to 18th century standards. And one of the really fun things about Passenger was having Nicholas have 18th century standards and Etta be a 21st century modern New Yorker and just see where their opinions and their beliefs collided, where they matched up, where they were pushing each other to kind of see and experience empathy, as you were saying. Um, but yeah, one of the really interesting discoveries I made while I was writing the series was that I think time travel would have been, is really only fun for maybe white men who could yeah. navigate different cultures a little bit easier than a young woman could or a young African-American male could. I um, think about that a lot because you get these sort of silly questions sometimes that are like, if you could live in any time period, <laughs> yeah. what would it be? And I'm like, mm. this one? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I love even the vote, so. Yeah. And also antibiotics, so yeah. 
don't know yeah. that I would go back past the 20. It is true. I think that a lot of people do think of time travel. As you're talking about that, I, I guess it's not something that I think of all that often. I, 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 you know, but I think you're right. It's incredibly different, obviously, to time travel if you're somebody who yeah. um, hasn't always been treated fairly in this world yeah, uh, or doesn't have a fair shot. Yeah, least. and Etta really um, experiences that firsthand with Nicholas because she's, as a young white woman, she just has never thought about someone having to constantly navigate other people's opinions and fears and biases and prejudices the way Nicholas constantly has to assess where he is and how people around him might be feeling. So that was very interesting for me to experience through Etta and I hope for readers too. And Lee, your series, which is this, you know, huge New York Times thing, you're just, it's been running, it's like <laughs> this runaway thing. and everybody's loving it. it. It was always conceived as a duology and mm -hmm. you have all these different characters and things. This book was so dense and, and lush and beautiful, so is Passenger, obviously, but, and for, this is for both of you. As you're thinking about the second book, did you realize how much you left to wrap up when you were done with the first? And you're like, hmm, maybe it should be three <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. I did have that moment where I was like, oh, well, I thought this would be easier because it's only two. I thought so, but too. No. And I, was so, I feel like you actually write three books, but you get paid for two. two. Because yeah. I well, think that's like Harry our, Potter books kept getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. Yeah, they keep getting longer yeah. and... Um, and there is a lot to do in two books. You know, in general, I'm a very firm believer in a three-act structure, right? But the way I think about these books is they're really one giant book. You yeah. Know? Like, that's the, the, like, that is the midpoint of that book is the midpoint of, like, one giant novel. Me too. And I feel yeah. like the... And I told people, like, go back and read the first book before you do the second one. It's not just about catching up. It's also because there's all this mirroring that's built in with the structures of the chapters. Because I like yeah. to have fun. Me too. I was all <laughs> these mir mirrors built in. Um, with language and stuff, and mm -hmm. um, it was it was definitely a challenge. But I think for me too, like writing heists and cons and scams is exhausting. Um, it requires this level of detailed plotting, and you're always sort of trying to outdo yourself, and you're always trying to hold something in reserve for the reader. But you're trying to build in the crumbs so yeah. that the reader doesn't feel like it was a cheap reveal at the end. So. Um, it, it was challenging in a way that I, I had never sort of anticipated. So I was definitely like, there will not be three books. There will be two. <laughs> you know what? I, I was happy because I know that one of the people that you talk about a lot is George R. R. Martin in The Song of Ice and Fire and this multiple series yeah. and the many, many years that happened between those books. I was so glad, and so are your fans, <laughs> that you have sort of a, a slightly faster writing pace. No. That, uh, <laughs> they get there. No. To, be fair, <laughs> to be fair, my books are a lot shorter than his. Like that, those two books together are like half of one of his books. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. I, I do love that what you're doing is instead of writing one incredibly long series, you're exploring the world in different corners of it, different yeah. shadows and hidden places. I think that's really cool. Thank you, friend. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think in terms of, I am really impressed with authors like Brandon Sanderson and who can like think in these crazy long series, but yeah. I tend to think in smaller stories mm -hmm. and I don't know why. Me too. I, I think... I would, my mind wanders once I hit book three. I'm like, what can I work on now? I think I also like to sort of step back um, because the things that I've created start to feel limiting. And I think with fantasy, you really want to be thinking, what's the next, what's the next cool thing that I can do? What's, what's the place I haven't explored on the map? Yeah. And so uh, sort of stepping back allows for me to like, uh, sort of shift back and be like, oh, I'm gonna go to this corner, I'm gonna go to that corner. But I leave a lot of threads open, which I think sometimes drives people a little crazy. Yeah. Not me. I love these books and I love what you're doing too. And I can't wait for Wayfair to come out. And um, also that you, you reference Wonder Woman and you worked in Star Wars stuff and that your, your yeah. side lives are really fascinating and have so many fans in its own right. And they're telling me that... Uh, I like the Star Wars as your side piece. <laughs> yes, that's that little we project on the side. <laughs> well, I know that we'll have you back because some of those things are going to continue. But thanks for joining us today at the Mind Book Fair, Lee Bardugo and Alexandra Bracken. Thank so great you. to have you here. Thanks awesome. for having us.